Hi, I'm Sal McCoglano, Associate Professor of History at Campbell University, a former Merchant Mariner and an adjunct professor of maritime industry policy at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. And welcome to this, What's Going On With Shipping, the End of the Week Roundup. It is May 28th, and there's a lot going on in shipping. I was going to do a series of separate small episodes, but I figured I'd put them all together here into one big one and talk about them. we got four things that are going on. We've got a collision, we've got a fire, we've got an arrest, and we've got a record-breaking event. So let's jump into these and, and talk about each of them because each of them have, have an amazing uh, sub story behind them. So the first story we have is a collision. It's a collision between two vessels in the inland sea of Japan. Uh, this vessel, the Ulsan Pioneer, which is a Marshall Islands flag chemical carrier, was en route from China to Japan when she had a collision. Uh, the collision took place earlier today in the Inland Sea, and unfortunately, it involves fatalities. The Japanese ship, the Bayuko, was hit. She's a roll-on, roll-off carrier. I'll show you what that vessel looks like here in a second. And as of right now, there are three members of the crew missing. Uh, the captain, Tatsumoto Sato, at 66, the first engineer, and the second engineer are still missing. The remainder of the crew, the remaining nine, had been picked up. Uh, and have been uh, rescued. The Ulsan Pioneer obviously has suffered massive bow damage. It looks like it was a, a square on hit uh, against the vessel. This was being reported. This story uh, comes out of the Japanese Times right off from the very beginning. Three people are missing after a Japanese cargo ship sank early on Friday following a collision with a foreign vessel. They always love to identify foreign vessels, in this case, Marshall Islands Registry. Uh, ship sank at around 2.45 a.m., so early in the morning on Friday. Uh, we see this take place. This is the second major incident this week involving a Japanese ship. A, a fishing boat capsized earlier this week uh, due to a collision uh, with a Russian vessel. Uh, the story is also in G-Captain. Uh, we see the same very similar story to hit. This is the roll-on, roll-off carrier that was hit. Uh, it's a small roll-on, roll-off carrier, more of a ferry than anything else. These vessels are extremely dangerous should they suffer damage basically what you have here this is the bow of the vessel here's the stern this is the stern ramp she has looks looks like two quarter stern ramps one on each quarter that comes down and then inside would be decks kind of like a parking garage the problem with these vessels is if you penetrate the hull there's almost no watertight integrity in the vessel because of the car deck nature so when she takes a hit starts flooding with water she can very easily start taking in water capsize sink go down fairly quickly, which seems to have been the case here. Here is the area where it took it. This is the Ulsan Pioneer right here. She was coming out of uh, uh, Nanjing, heading to Osaka, uh, currently not under command, as you'll see here. I'm going to zoom in here to the channel. This is the Inland Sea, an absolute just busy, busy place for traffic. As you'll see here, these lines are ferry routes uh, coming in there. There she is right there. She is uh, at uh, basically not under command right now. If we pull up her pass track, let's see if we can get her pass track here pulled up. There we go. If we zoom out here, you can see her track coming in there, uh, coming in to the Inland Sea. If we zoom in here a little bit more, let's see if we can move it here a little bit. There we go. So you can see her basically her track right there where she was and then where she stopped. Obviously, this is where the collision took place. It is interesting to note that she is coming out of the channel here. Uh, she's not really a channel, I should say this. There, there are not always clear vessel traffic controls here. You're supposed to stay to the right side as much as possible, but you can maneuver around as needed. Uh, when you have a lot of vessels crossing your path, this is particularly true in places like the English Channel, you have to deviate out of those channels. Uh, this is uh, the Bioko. Uh, unfortunately, her pass track only takes her as far as right here as we see. So here she is coming in into the channel right here. Let's zoom in here. Sorry, I went the wrong way there. There we go. So coming in here, passing between the islands, she's on the right side. Looks like she was up here coming on to the on her right side. It's hard to tell. Again, we don't have a track for her in here. We're not sure what exactly happened. Somebody asked me on Twitter today about this. It's like, well, how can these ships have collisions? Don't they see each other? Uh, again, heavily trafficked area, a lot of traffic in there. And I'll remind everybody that three American destroyers, the Porter, the Fitzgerald, and the McCain, have all suffered collisions. And those are vessels that are fitted with the most advanced radar suites 
we know of on the planet. So just because you have radar, just because you see what's going on, understand it, 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 it's a small little margin of error here. You know, what keeps you from having an accident on a highway on a road is a, a 16th of an inch of yellow paint keeping somebody on their side of the road and you on your side of the road as you scream past each other at 110 miles an hour, you know, going each way. So in many ways, it, it, it takes a little bit and there's no yellow paint separating this. And so these collisions do happen, unfortunately, on a, on a fairly regular basis. And unfortunately, in this case, what we've seen here is a catastrophic loss of the vessel and a loss of life, which is, uh, of course, one of those things that, that happen in the maritime trade. We just see it here. And in this area, in the Inland Sea here, as you'll see, and again, come back to this image right here. This is... Uh, uh, where we see it take place. It's going to be examined. Uh, it'll be investigated. Obviously, a lot going on. This is within Japanese territorial waters. So this all falls under the jurisdiction of the Japanese maritime forces. They will have jurisdiction over this, even though you're dealing with a Japanese flag vessel and a Marshall Island flag vessel, you're within the inland waterways of Japan. So that's going to be handling there. Second story, we go to Sri Lanka in the Express Pearl. Uh, still on fire, still smoldering off the coast of Sri Lanka. The vessel is getting low in the water, according to reports. This is the G-Captain report right here. Uh, she's been burning now. You can see the collapse there. Uh, the two, uh, the midship and the aft crane have collapsed. The deck has given way. You can see the sag in the, in, in the boom right there. Remember, steel, steel, steel will start to bend at about 450 degrees Celsius, about 800 degrees Fahrenheit. So it gives you an idea of how hot this fire uh, became on board. We have a video here. This is the Sri Lankan uh, uh, Navy, I believe it is. I think it's the Sri Lankan Navy, uh, Sri Lankan Air Force, excuse me, Sri Lankan Air Force. Uh, they've been on scene the entire time. If you want to go over to their YouTube page, uh, they've got all these videos here. And of course, I'll have links to all these in the show notes here. You can see the images here. Smoke turning from black to white. That means, again, the fire is starting to run out of fuel. Uh, which is a good thing. Everything has basically been burned that can be burned. You still see black smoke, obviously, on it, but not as black and heavy as it was. Uh, the engine, ha uh, the, the aft house there is fairly well gutted. Again, danger here is fire gets into the engine room. You start blowing seals down the engine room. She starts taking water back aft and could potentially begin to sink. Uh, her watertight integrity has probably been compromised in decks because of collapses of containers. So obviously the, the sinking of the vessel is, is, is a large issue. You see uh, right here, offshore vessels spraying waters right there. They're not, it doesn't look like they're doing anything, but actually what they're doing is keeping the heat off them. Uh, the ship will be radiating massive amounts of heat and toxic smoke because of the nitric acid on board. So they'll keep the water between them and the vessel to basically make sure that they're not getting anything on them and keep it away. But you can just see this, the, the, the collapse of the container stacks there. One of the things that we do know is some of these containers have fallen into the ocean. Some of them are washing ashore. I got a story here. I'll show you in a second about that. And so we do know that this issue is, 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 is turning into a big environmental issue right here. This is from Lodestar. Uh, they're talking about this as lost boxes begin to wash ashore. You don't know what's in these boxes. There's no telling. We know that there was 25 tons of nitric acid on board, but we don't know what's in, in the rest of the, the containers. At this time, here's a close-up shot I thought was really interesting. Uh, this is a shot from Lloyd's List. Uh, they were able to get that shot really close. You can see how the hull has been bent and kind of compromised here. You get that bow crane right there, the sag right there, and you just get a more of a visual image of what fire does. Fire is the worst enemy for anybody on a ship. It, it is the worst. At least they were close enough to land to get assistance from, <coughs> excuse me, from shore. The big story we talked about on the last uh, episode and really important is Sam Chambers over at Splash uh, 247 did a great story where he talked about the fact that Qatar in India refused permission of this vessel to come in to offload the containers. It, that they, they encountered the, the fact that the nitric acid on board the containers had shifted. They had a leak on board. They wanted to get the containers off, get the hazardous material taken care of. Both Qatar and India refused to allow this vessel to offload. Not their problem let the vessel go on. She had a fire. They thought they had the fire contained and then the fire exploded into something larger. And now you have the catastrophic loss of this vessel. And now Colombo's getting ready to deal with the, the impact of this. Oil spill, this vessel will probably be using diesel fuel. So probably not the heavy bunker fuel oil that you'll see in the spill. I think the bigger issue here is the contaminants from the containers coming ashore and other issues associated with the vessel. 
uh, I think uh, this this has the potential to be a, a big disaster. We saw one earlier last year, uh, the Wakashio, a bulker that ran aground in Mariches. Uh, again, a, a catastrophic disaster for the island of Mariches. Now Sri Lanka is about to potentially experience the same thing. The worst part about this story and almost all stories involving maritime is this. They're all preventable. Uh, they're all preventable. In this case, had they been able to get in, even if Qatar and, and India didn't allow the vessel to offload the containers pier side, what they were worried about is the ship comes pier side, has this fire explosion, and you you repeat Beirut. They could have had the vessel out at anchor. She had container cranes on board. She could have picked and, and offloaded containers, gotten the troubled containers off, gotten a hazmat team on board, and prevented it from happening. But again, that that did not happen. That did not happen. And now this becomes Sri Lanka's problem, along with the, with the ship owner Express uh, Marine out of Singapore. So just a, again, another disaster. So we've had a collision. We've had fire, and now we head over here to the latest with Ever Given in the Suez Canal. In this case, Suez Canal head blames Ever Given grounding on speed and rudder. So I did a, a what's going on in the Suez episode earlier this week. I feel free to jump over there to take a look at it. I'll include it again in here but now this this issue is getting to be finger pointing of epic proportions the suez canal is pointing at the vessel the vessel owner is pointing at the suez canal and now it's 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 hitting the mainstream uh, it's getting out of the courts and and being uh, discussed here so this is a reuters story that gcap has talking about the fact that the chairman of of the suez canal uh osama rabi on thursday came amid a dispute over compensation with the owners insurers ever given, which is detained by court order. It goes on here. Talk about a legal team for the Japanese owner, Shoshi Kisin. Shoshi Kisin is, is the owner of the vessel. They, they lease it to Evergreen. It's operated by a German company and it gets into all those international issues. Basically the dispute here is over detention and claims. Uh, one of the things that they've been able to do is get basically the Suez Canal Authority to bring down their claim from 916 million to 550 million. And basically even a little further down saying that if you pay $200 million deposit, you can release the vessel. Uh, the Suez is saying that the uh, Shoshi Kisan has offered $150 million to do this. So we're, we're right in the butter zone there. They're, 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 they're disputing this, but the dispute now has gotten beyond money into a fixing blame because the liability for this incident is going to be astronomical in terms of cost because it's not just the delay of the ever given it's a delay of the 400 plus vessels that were impacted by this and what they're saying basically right here is is a couple of things in this story and there's a few of these stories here i have here so here's the splash story sam chambers talking about ever given was traveling too fast according to the suez canal authority and if you look at my video i did on the grounding of the ever given again i'll include it in the show notes uh you'll see that she was going fast but the reason for her speed was to get control of the vessel and in truth, if she had just slowed down, if she had just slowed down a bit and, and, and not had gotten up to speed she was at, the grounding would have been less. But the question here is who is ordering those speed orders? Was it the master? Was it the pilots on board? Because Suez Canal pilots do not assume command of the vessel. The master has overall authority of the vessel. But the Suez Canal Authority pilots do provide expert guidance. They're supposed to give you information. They don't always do. I've been through the Suez Canal. I know this. Uh, but they're also are going to tell you when or not to enter the canal and what your speed limit is within the canal. So this issue now is, is a big blame game between the two. Uh, and again, what we're seeing here is, is this dispute between them. I think when we come back to this story here, I come back to this one from, from G captain here right now is what they're basically talking about here is, is how to get this vessel released. Uh, obviously, the, the 916 million was way too much. And that had to do with the fact that, that, that the, the Suez Canal overestimated the value of the ship and the cargo. That was one of the big things here. It's actually mentioned right here, uh, basically saying that it was uh, uh, the, the value was only 775 million versus the 3 billion estimate they had the value of the ship is only 140 million and this is the other argument right here the owner of the ship can sit there and say you know what you you own the ship i can get a cheap i can get a new ship cheaper than i can pay the suez canal if the suez canal wants 200 million 300 million 550 million 916 million that's more than the 140 million it costs to build the ship now the cargo is a whole different issue but in terms of the ship owners 
that's what they're looking at here. Again, this story, I think, is, is really the interesting one here, because, again, what Sam talks about here is the issue between the pilots and the master. And those are the two groups, the two pilots that were on board and the ship's master are, are going to go here. If you read through this story again, uh, uh, I just want to highlight a couple of things that they have here. So Rabi, who's the, again, the head of the uh, Suez Canal, said the captain should have held the ship back. If there was an issue of wind, it's not the Suez Canal Authority, it's the ship's captain. He knows the capabilities of the ship, so he can come and go. I don't want to enter. I feel the weather is not appropriate. Roy, uh, Rabi tell Reuters, adding the ship was traveling too fast and the rudder was not aligned. There are a lot of technical faults. Among those with the rudder size was not appropriate to the size of the ship. Okay, well, now we're getting into very technical details here about the size of the vessel, the size of the ship's rudder, and whether or not it had control. We know from based on the video on the AIS track, she never was in the center of the canal. She kept going from bank to bank during this. But was that due to the size of the rudder or was it due to wind coming in here? And so all of this is, is, is playing out here in this fight between the Suez Canal and the Ever, Evergreen and the ship's owner. So we're seeing this fight just just evolve at this. And, and again, it, it's it's the ship's crew and those who have cargo on board ever given are caught in the middle. She's still sitting there in the middle of the Suez waiting for a, a, a decision of some kind. So that's collision. That's fire. That's arrest. And now we come to record breaking. So this week, kind of behind the scenes, not everyone has seen this or not, but the CMCGM Marco Polo has arrived along the east coast of the United States. At 16,000 boxes, she is the largest vessel ever to come into East Coast ports. Uh, she came into New York, went under the newly lifted Bayonne Bridge. One of the reasons they lifted the Bayonne Bridge was so that vessels this size can come in. And so now here's this vessel, 16,000 boxes. Again, Ever Given has 20,000 boxes. Uh, Express Pearl is a much smaller vessel, only about 1,500 boxes. Uh, but here's this vessel coming in. And this was the story in American Shipper talking about her getting ready to go into Savannah. And I have this great little graphic here that shows the, the, the size and scale of this vessel uh, compared to the USS Yorktown, the ship, uh, uh, the, the aircraft carrier, the Essex class aircraft carrier ship museum down in Charleston. Uh, absolutely a, a, a massive, massive vessel. And then there's this video here. This is the video here from Georgia ports of her coming into Savannah uh, the other day. And, and, and again, Unless you've seen vessels this size and this scale, they are absolutely behemoths. And again, she is not an ultra large container ship. She's not one of the big monsters. She's not a 20 to 24,000 box ship. She's big. She's, she's huge, 16,000 boxes. But she is not one of the big monsters that we see in. However, again, go back to the problem that Express Pearl had with a fire on board. Uh, she had a fire on board on her deck, very hard to access those containers. And what we saw was the catastrophic loss of this vessel. Now look at CMA, CGM, Marco Polo, and you get the image here of, of a vessel, the size and scale that is rarely seen and how precarious, again, our ocean commerce can be, whether stuck in the Suez Canal, whether caught on fire, whether involved in the collision. Uh, you just get that imagery right there. You can see the size of the tugs alongside of her. One of the things that Rabi was talking about in the Suez Canal was because the Ever Given was going so fast, tugboats with her couldn't help and assist. Uh, tugboats are very hard to use on a vessel unless a vessel this size is not moving and very low winds. If it's high winds and the vessel's moving, it, it's very difficult. You'll see right here, the tugs are basically have lines on them right there. Uh, basically, that is in case the ship does lose power, they, they're they hooked up, they're ready to start pulling on her, but she's going to come in at a very slow speed. If you've ever been in Savannah, this is the bridge on the Savannah, there's the grain uh, silos over there. Her big issue in coming into Savannah was two, one was water depth, and the other is what's called air draft, getting under the bridge. Uh, you've got to clear the bridge. Uh, you don't want to hit the bridge. We've seen ships do this. It, 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 it's not a good thing. So anyway, I thought I'd share those stories with you. Uh, lock obviously going on this week. And so I thought a weekly recap here would be a good one. So again, we'll be following the story of uh, the Ulsan Pioneer and the Bioko in, in Japan. Uh, the fire on Express Pearl is still an issue that's ongoing. Ever Given, story that will never go away, is the Ever Given. It's, it's, it's an everlasting story, is the Ever Given. And then the story about CM, uh, CMA, CGM, uh, Marco Polo, I think is really interesting for, for examining 
uh, how we are dependent upon this ocean shipping for our cargo. As we see right now, that vessel going down the East Coast of the United States, dropping off boxes and picking them up for return back to Europe. I'm Sal McCracklano. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you do, please like it, uh, uh, subscribe to the channel, uh, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos when they come out and share the video. Let other people know about this. Again, I try to make these, these videos short, concise, easy to understand, let you have an insight into the maritime industry that you may not be getting from other news sources out there. So I'm Sal McCracklano signing off. Have a good weekend.